What's up, Packer fans? Happy Wednesday. Welcome into the Pack-A-Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. Today, I'm going to be jumping into two of the more fun players in all of the 2021 NFL draft, and that is Kadarius Toney and Elijah Moore. And I want to jump into both right away. And this actually might not be quite what you're thinking. I am going to break down both Elijah Moore and Kadarius Toney just a bit, but I'm going to more spend time of going over what they would bring to Green Bay's offense and whether or not Green Bay would actually spend the draft capital for this specific type of player. And the reason I'm going in that direction is because, to be totally honest, you know what Kadarius uh, Tony and Elijah Moore can do. They are game-breaking gadget players who can take it to the house anytime they touch the ball. They are incredibly fun to watch. Um, Elijah Moore is definitely on the shorter side, around what, 5'9", I think it was. Uh, Kadarius Tony closer to six feet tall. Uh, but these are special, special elite players in space, slot receivers, gadget players. Put them in the backfield, use them as running backs. You can do a variety of different things with them, ends around, reverses. They can go horizontally. You know, you, They can use their speed horizontally. They can use it vertically. They're ridiculous after the catch. There's a lot of things with football that you can't just put on a highlight video and say, listen, that's who the player is, right? You have to go into the All-22. You have to get dig into the nuance. What can they do? What can't they do? And things like that. Kadarius Toney and Elijah Moore might be the two closest players there. You can just throw on the highlight video and you pretty much get the gist of who they are as players. And both players, um, you know, both teams love getting the ball in their hands, getting them into space, letting them use their raw natural talent and speed and athleticism. And they're just special, special, incredibly fun players that legitimately all 32 teams would love to have on their roster to be able to use in a variety of different ways. But I think in order to understand what Green Bay is trying to accomplish on offense specifically will give us a better indication and idea as to whether or not they would use premium draft capital on a player like a Kadarius Toney or an Elijah Moore. So let's start there. And I think we got a really great idea this past season and really the last two seasons with Matt LaFleur, but I think last season was definitely more in his image. And it's not a mistake when you see guys like Alan Lazard and Mercedes Lewis and Robert Tunyon and these H-backs like Josiah DeGuara and Dominique Daphne. There is a role for playmakers in this offense. Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams, and even to an extent, Marquez Valdez-Scantling are evidence of that, right? But if you're not one of those players, you basically need to be a glue guy that's making everything else work around you. And that's your Alan Lazards, that's your Mercedes Lewis, that's your Bobby Tunyon, that's your Josiah DeGuara, that's, you know, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Like, those are the type of players that are making everything else on the offense go. And what Matt LaFleur is trying to accomplish is he's trying to make things as complicated as possible for defenses. If you're going to go with a smaller defense, a nickel dime defense, he wants to be able to run the ball down your throat, whether it be with AJ Dillon or, or Aaron Jones, he's going to get you mismatched in small boxes where the offensive line can do the, the heavy lifting and the yeoman's work. We saw it against the Rams where he got five on five matchups, which is insane in today's NFL, where you're going to get five offensive linemen versus five box defenders. And your running back is basically free on plays, or at least is one-on-one uh, -on -one with the safety who's further back. Like he is a match scientists when it comes to that stuff. But um, with that comes the ability for those guys on the outside to be able to do a lot of the little things. And that's why you see an Alan Lazard and an MVS in the slot. An MVS who developed magnificently as a blocker over the course of the last couple seasons and specifically last year. And part of that as well is because he's using some of those jet sweeps in motion. So if you do hand it off to a receiver, the guys on the outside can block for you. If you do one of those quick bubble screens to the outside, um, then your, your, excuse me, your, your receivers or who's ever out there can do the heavy lifting and do the blocking for you and win some of those matchups so that you can get extra yardage. This offense is based upon the fact that you're going to be able to block at any point of the field, whether it's out to the right, whether it's out to the left, whether it's straight up ahead, everyone outside, inside, everywhere, for the most part, needs to be able to block. And there, there is one exception to that to some extent, and that's Devontae Adams. And, and Adams is the true playmaker and the alpha on this offense, besides Aaron Rodgers, of course. But And they've allowed, I think, him to be able to say, you know, you don't need to be the, the best blocker in the world because you're Devontae freaking Adams and you're the best receiver in football. But if you all of a sudden have two, three of those guys on offense, a lot of the concepts that Matt LaFleur wants to run start going out the window because 
the opposing defensive backs and, and linebackers that get sideline to sideline and so on and so forth are going to be able to attack and just break up some of those plays. A great example of that is that, that MVS fumble against the Colts. Um, part of that is, you know, the reason that he fumbled is because there's a player there right away. If that's blocked up better and there's not a player there, he gets easy yardage on the play and said it's a fumble, a turnover. It's still on MVS for fumbling, but um, it's a great example of a play where if you don't have the players that can block up the play, um, things can go very bad in a hurry and you're just, your concepts just strictly don't work. We also should know that there is a, a time and a place four gadget players within this offense. Kyler Irvin is a great, perfect example of that. And you can kind of get away with not having to be a perfect blocker because you're basically taking defenders with you by going in motion. And, you know, by going in motion, you're usually, if they're in man, they're taking a you know, defender with you. If they're in zone, they still have to be aware that, you know, you're out on the side. So you're kind of doing the job of blocking, even though you're not blocking in that specific way. Um, of course, you could be the one that's actually getting the football. So if you're the one that's receiving the ball, it's not so important for you to be blocking on the play either. So there's definitely ways to get around that if you're not the greatest blocker in the world. And Matt LaFleur has some of that baked into his offense. Um, and even with, you know earlier in the season, you know, I, let's just look at Tyler Irvin actually throughout the season. He only played in eight games. He played 142 snaps, which is about 18 snaps per game. And he actually had, let's see, five games, weeks two, three, four, eight, nine, where he was over 20 plus snaps on offense. So it's not like this is this eight or nine snap role where you're just, you know, uh, you know, getting a cup of coffee in the game. This is a legitimate role when you have a player like that. And remember, he wasn't healthy later in the season, went out with injury. They didn't really get him as involved when he came back. But earlier in the season, that was a legitimate role within this Matt LaFleur offense. Now imagine if you're giving 20 plus snaps to a Tyler Irvin, imagine how many snaps you might want to give to a Kadarius Toney or to an Elijah Moore, who is an infinitely better player just in that role in and of itself, not to mention a legitimate true wide receiver. So you can easily see a situation where that 20 snaps turns into 30 or 40 snaps. Maybe not full time, maybe not your 60, 70 snaps, but 30 to 40 snaps, I think is a legitimate possibility. So there's definitely an opportunity for a player like this in uh, Matt LaFleur's offense. And it's not like the Green Bay Packers and their general manager structure. And I know Brian Gutekunst wasn't around at the time, but you still have this general trend from Wolf to Thompson to Brian Gutekunst. There's some general ideas that remain the same. Even Ted Thompson was willing to go out and get a Randall Cobb, who was on the shorter side. Now, he had more of a physical presence and he was a kick returner to begin with. He was a punt returner to begin with. Um, but he was definitely more of a physical presence and definitely more of your typical slot receiver. He did some gadget stuff lined up in the backfield from time to time. So we've seen even Ted Thompson go, or, you know, what was it, early to mid second round to get a player like Randall Cobb that could do some of the things, you know, that Kadarius Tony and Elijah Moore could do. And to be fair, just with this pure speed and athleticism that that Tony and, and Moore have, I think you can make a strong argument that Moore and Tony might be able to do it at a better level than even Randall Cobb did, which is saying something because Cobb had such a phenomenal career in Green Bay. So with all of that being said, there's a role for it within the offense. They, you know, they've drafted a Randall Cobb in the second in the past. It would make sense that these type of very special athletic players could be, you know, in mind for Green Bay with pick 29. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, depending upon how you feel about the situation, I don't personally think that's going to be the case. And and here's why not. What you're getting with a player at pick 29 here, and it, let's just say that like Tony could easily be gone at this point, right? But let's say Tony and Elijah Moore are sitting there at 29 and, and Green Bay is contemplating taking them. What are you getting? Now you're getting an absolute playmaker. And I just want to, before I even get into this, I want to go on the record for a second and saying, I think the number one thing that's missing on this Packers offense right now is a threat of you can just get it in their hands in one of those bubble screens or on a handoff and they can just take it to the house. Like a, a player that's got that 4 three forty speed that at any given time, if you're not you know, sound defensively, they're going to make you burn for it and they can make a few guys miss in the open field. That's the, to me, the one ingredient that this Packers offense is missing. However, Without that ingredient, the Packers were the number one scoring offense in the league last year. They looked like a juggernaut all season long. Even when Devontae Adams was out, they looked fantastic. Like there, there wasn't anything stopping this offense. So how much more octane do you need on offense than to be the number one scoring offense in the NFL? And 
my next point here is what it, what are you ultimately getting? Elijah Moore and Kadarius Tony, at least to begin with, and I think Tony, I think Tony ends up being a, a true slot through the majority of his career. I think there's a chance Elijah Moore could play a little bit more on the outside and, and develop more into a wide receiver. He has some serious Brandon Cooks comps to me, um, very similar in movement. I think. Moore is actually a better gadget player than Cooks was, but I think Moore could actually develop into a Brandon Cooks type receiver. Tony's special, but he reminds me more of that Percy Harvin, not that necessarily the strength that Harvin had, but like that true gadget slot receiver with a little bit of Tyree kill, just that ridiculous, insane speed as well. Um, but either way, um, they're 90% going to line up in the slot. They're not giving you any wide receiver versatility where they can line up as left wide receiver, right wide receiver, you know, X, Y, whatever you want to call it. They're they're primarily slant receiver, or slant or slot receivers, excuse me. So they're primarily slot receivers. Now in this offense, again, I mentioned to you already, let's say that that bounces up to like, instead of 20 snaps with a Tyler Irvin, that's like a more 35 to 40 snaps within Matt LaFleur. So you might be saying, all right, so they can give you 35 to 40 snaps in the slot, maybe a little bit of a gadget player in the backfield, maybe do some kick returning and punt returning. The issue is Kadarius Toney and Elijah Moore, they didn't do much returning in college. Both of them did some, um, but neither of them did a ton. And that leads me to believe that maybe they didn't trust their hands uh, ultimately in that return role. Now, if you think that they can be both kick returner and punt returner, that certainly adds to their value. But if not, if you don't think that they can do that, now they're not playing outside wide receiver. You can play him some in the gadget running back role, but how many snaps are there going to be there when you've already got AJ Dillon and Aaron Jones? Those are going to be your primary guys in the backfield, even with one of those guys there. So there's not a huge role there either. I just mentioned there's 30 to 40 snaps in that slot that they could play in that gadget type of role. They're not going to be gunners on special teams. They're not going to be punt protectors. They're they're not going to be on any other special teams unless they're the actual returner, just because that's not the type of ability that they have. So there's a real opportunity that if you spend a first round pick on them, you're primarily looking at maybe 35 to 40 snaps per game in a gadget role and not always being able to fulfill exactly what Matt LaFleur wants out of that position as a pure you know, blocker and, and just doing all the little things that comes around with being within this Matt LaFleur offense. So as much as I would love a, a gadget player that has the ability to take it to the house at any time and run a 4-3-40 and be dynamic and make people miss in the open field, I think there's a real chance that Green Bay says, we simply don't value that one role with a first round prospect and agree or disagree with that as you may. Um, but I, th- I think that ultimately that's probably the case. And when you start looking at this wide receiver group, and as I mentioned in the past, when we looked at free agents, there's not guys on this roster that your top four guys, four or five guys aren't playing much special teams as it is already. So, uh, you know, to add another receiver that needs some playing time, that doesn't do everything that you want them to be able to do, that may not be adding to the special teams room. I I just think it's a tough sell to spend pick 29. Now, all of that being said, if draft day comes and Elijah Moore or Kadarius Toney, either of their names are called, I will be running around my house, going down the slide, doing everything. Yes, I have a slide in my house, for those of you who don't know, doing all of it. Like I will be ecstatic because I mean, how both players are two of the more fun players that you could possibly scout in this year's draft. I mean, the play with Kadarius Toney against South Carolina, where he runs a ridiculous route, and then there's literally five defenders converging on Toney, and he just sprints through it, runs through contact, and scores a touchdown, is literally one of the most aesthetically pleasing football plays that I have ever seen in my life. There is stuff on tape with both of these guys that just makes you drop your jaw and just say, just give every draft pick for him. Like, they're that fun. So do I think Green Bay ultimately pulls the trigger with a pick 29? I don't. I don't think they're they're going to see the value there. Would I mind if I was wrong in this scenario and they went with either player and they went with an explosive playmaker? I'd be all in. It would be so fun to watch and just screw the rest. As This is an offensive league as... as um, Nick Saban just recently, you know, basically said in his interview, like the game has changed. Like you're not going to hold teams down on defense anymore with the with the rules the way that they are. You just got to go and score a bunch of points. So if if Tony or Elijah Moore help you do that, then go out and get those guys and help you score more points. So I'm all in if they go that direction. I'm just very skeptical skeptical that Brian Gutekunst actually would. Now, if either of those players insanely fell to the second round and Green Bay moved up. 
Um, maybe a Rondale Moore again falls down in the second round. I think a player like Amari Rogers would make a ton of sense, who actually is much more physical as a blocker and I think is much more of that Randall Cobb type comp where he's going to be a slot receiver, but he's so strong after the catch. Um, you know, tacklers just bounce off of him. He's got a tough lower half. And uh, again, I think he can be a little bit more of that. And I think as we saw with Randall Cobb, I think Green Bay's value for that position is more second round based than first round based. So I'm not saying that they won't address this position, just that I think for what they're trying to accomplish in Matt LaFleur's offense and for what they value overall, I think a first round pick would be steep in either of these scenarios for either Elijah Moore or Kadarius Tony. So would be happy to be proven wrong, would love either pick. I'm not sure it's the best use of resources based on what Green Bay needs, but sometimes just screw it and have fun and go get guys that would be ridiculous on Madden in, a, in the actual game and in every other way and just be a joy to watch. And sometimes that's worth it in and of itself. So go get them by all means, but I'm skeptical that Green Bay will go in that direction. That's going to do it for me. Make sure to check out today's audio podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts. I'll be right back here tomorrow, of course, of course. But uh, until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.